Good morning, everybody. So maybe I should uh, let loose a disclaimer here. I'm going to talk about cars, not exactly vehicles. Right? <laughs> the car is actually the individual form of uh, transport. And uh, the legislative situation was flagged a few times now. Uh, there are actually two aspects to legislation. One is the type approval uh, in, the, in the form of the Vienna Convention. And this is currently being addressed. Um, there is change on the way. The other thing that is often overlooked is actually liability law. And this is what is most concerning. If you look at the accident situation today, uh, the cost that is typically um, um, allocated to the, uh, to the guy who caused the accident by either himself or by his insurance, and the portion of that is roughly 99%. And only 1% of all cases is actually falling back to the manufacturer of the car. Now you can actually imagine what happens if you t start to automate cars. What will happen is there will be a shift of liability uh, towards the manufacturers, of course. And this has consequences for the introduction of autonomous or automatic vehicles. These vehicles need to be much more intelligent, I would almost say, compared to today's drivers, right? The funny story is that in order to get a driver's license, anybody can get a driver's license and I'm almost tempted to say, unless he's a car, right? For cars, the thresholds are pretty high to be intelligent. And I wanted to show you real brief uh, what is actually necessary to uh, make cars intelligent and where the, uh, the, the limits actually of uh, smart cars, i.e. connected cars, really are. The benefits uh, for society the benefits for society, I believe, have to be uh, regarded under the view of who is, is going to fund this disruptive development. And uh, my and our belief at Intel is actually that the consumer is going to fund it. And it, he's going to fund it through the benefits that he gets from this. So we have more leisure, uh, more comfort through uh, introduction of autonomy or automatic driving. Uh, we can actually bring mobility to people who have been neglected, who have not been able to take part in, uh, in individual mobility so far, like the disabled or the elderly people, people who are generally uh, finding traffic today a bit uh, too confusing, right? They can actually really benefit from this. And of course, parking, using the available space in cities is one of the most important aspects that can bring in money to fund autonomous drive. And as I said before, uh, the liability shift is going to make all this much safer than before. Because nobody wants to carry the liability burden that is currently with the consumer. No company who is providing autonomous cars will actually be willing to uh, carry that liability. So we can assume that these cars will be inherently much more safer than what we have today on the cities, on the cars in the city. Okay, let's look at the situation with connectivity, cooperation on roads and streets is kind of new, right? If you think about it, individual transport means competition. If you think about motorsports, if you think about the general theme of individuality expressed in cars and their designs and their horsepower and so on, that has reached its limits. Today, you see that urban scenarios no longer are, uh, we are no longer able to sustain urban scenarios by uh, extreme mobility, extreme uh, co uh, competition. Cooperation is the name of the game. And uh, that is actually where uh, connectivity comes in. Connectivity allows you to stretch the horizon of perception, which is important for intelligent cars. Um, it also gives you the necessary information to make the proper decisions, i.e. Uh, control your drive vector, so to speak. Where do you want to drive? and uh, con uh, consider the feasibility, whether that is a feasible vector at all. But this is not going to cut it for the introduction of autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles. Be and one of the reasons for that is that decision-making through networks is too slow for an introduction scenario where lots of different kinds of uh, participants in traffic are competing against each other. The example was given before, what do you do with pedestrians or with bikers, the typical vulnerable pieces of the traffic? Uh, cars can probably deal very well with other cars, but how are they going to deal with uh, the vulnerable 
part of the traffic participants. And this is where the perception of the car itself comes into play. If we look at uh, communication systems that, that are currently being discussed, we have uh, spontaneous ad hoc networking, which gives you a response time on the order of a few hundred milliseconds. Then we have network-based and server-based systems that are very well to distribute maps and uh, can actually uh, help you to get more information about the infrastructure. Those have response times of two seconds. Okay, and these are real figures uh, being communicated by the giants of the industry in IT. Uh, so that is not going to help you in a situation where you have a speed of something like 60 or 50 kilo kilometers per hour and somebody is stepping into the street. You have to use the microseconds in this case. And this is where the question arises, do we need intelligence in the car itself beyond what the network can provide? And the answer is clearly yes. The car needs to become some kind of, has to get some kind of intelligence of its own. And this in intelligence, intelligence is actually comprised of uh, sensoric networks um, and uh, decision-making compute power, so to speak. Um, and uh, talking again about the legal situation, uh, the Wiener Übereinkommen, or the Vienna Convention was mentioned before, um, changes underway to change the basic concept that the driver always has to, has to be able to intervene in the Vienna Convention. There is actually a change proposed that stipulates theoretical overridability. Okay, just think about that for a moment. This is the way how to legally overcome the hurdle of the Vienna Convention as it is today, that the driver is mandated to be able to override the automatic system at all times. So we are looking at a concept of theoretical overridability. What does that mean? That clearly means robotic intelligence. So the car needs robotic intelligence to uh, get type approval, pretty much. Uh, and what is this robotic intelligence? It's pretty simple. The intelligence is generated by a computer. It's pretty much like in chess playing. Uh, in the meantime, the world chess champion can be beaten by a computer. This kind of intelligence can be brought to the car and it falls into three categories. The first category is to build a perceptual model. We have heard before that there are plenty of sensors in the car, but these sensors have to make sense. There must be some kind of in, uh, perceptual model that can actually bring all these different types of sensors together and build a model of the environment. The second phase is the motion planning. Um, the car's motion needs to be checked against the environmental constraints. If there is an obstacle, if there is a vulnerable participant in traffic, the car cannot just roll over that obstacle. And that brings the decision making into the game. Decision making is also a pretty compute intensive task um, where uh, the steering, the braking, and the acceleration of the car needs to be controlled and needs to be in a, uh, controlled in a functionally safe manner. So not only do we need compute power, but we also need to bring the compute power into the embedded system of a car in a functionally safe manner. Uh, in this little graph that I have included here, you can see uh, the amount, uh, the, the rate of increase for the what we call kilo DMIPS uh, that is required to make the car intelligent. And this is a projection until the, until the year 2024. The little bars are actually what you need in powertrain uh, to be able to conform to Euro 6 and beyond uh, to meet the emission standards. But you can see that the growth is kind of exponential when, you, when it comes to intelligence in the car and decision making uh, to replace the driver. And this is one of the disruptive changes in automotive that has happened over the last 30 years or so. There was common rail diesel eventually. There was, uh, uh, there was, auto, there was uh, assisted braking, assisted stability. And now we have autonomous driving, automated driving coming in. And this uh, creates another change in the, on the compute side for the car. We need more MIPS than currently the industry is willing to put into the car. And this brings also new players to the field. So there is an intense debate going on in the automotive world where to get the MIPS from. 
And it turns out that uh, companies who are predominantly active in the server space and in the consumer space, they are more likely to provide these MIPS than the tradi traditional suppliers. So there is a paradigm change happening as we speak. Uh, so we need to make use of uh, what in the industry is called Moore's Law. Fortunately enough, uh, Moore is still alive, and so is his uh, prediction for the future. We still can rely on the fact that compute power will double every 18 months, but less and less companies can actually sustain uh, this growth. So this is uh, what is kind of uh, listed under the key enabling technologies for automotive, and there is an intense discussion going on uh, on the European level. Okay, so the bottom line is uh, a car cannot be intelligent without enough intelligence of its own. A connected car is good, but for the future, in order to sustain the legal, uh, overcome the legal hurdles and sustain this kind of growth that the industry is uh, predicting, we need uh, a kind of local intelligence in the car. Thank you very much.